I'm Elisa Brisbane Boyd, graduated at Brisbane Grammar uh, and was educated at the University of Queensland. So he is one of our finest. Uh, he's a uh, law and arts grad and, uh, and after leaving the university he went on to work with, uh, as an associate to the then President of the Queensland Court of Appeals, Tony Fitzgerald. And Tony, of course, was over the Fitzgerald Inquiry, the corruption in Queensland uh, during the 1980s. From there, he went on to the Career Mail, which took him into the, uh, the media industry. He also played a bit of rugby uh, along the way, and he is a, he is a red. Uh, and just a bit of a plug, of course, of Queensland Rugby, which kicks off this season. <laughs> 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 so, right, get there we go. Get out to Suncorp, support the Reds. Uh, from there, Michael then uh, moved over to the States and uh, got a job with, um, with Time. And uh, he then covered the war in Iraq and has essentially lived through that war in Iraq. And he has a uh, has really, really interesting story to tell. He's currently back in Brisbane. Uh, has been back in Brisbane now for uh, for a few months, and it's our great pleasure to uh, to give him a bit of a homecoming and to welcome back one of our alum. So, Michael, thank you very much for making yourself available today, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Sir. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So you can just control it from here. Okay. And pause, and then you just feed, like if you have other ones. Gotcha. Just gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Awfully complicated. We may miss out on the audio visuals. Um, thank you very much for having me. To thank you. Thank you very much for having me today. It's actually a great honour. Um, I had a rather checkered history at University of Queensland, <laughs> but put it this way, I really enjoyed my university years. <laughs> um, I have a great fondness for the. Uh, what was then the School of Government, now the School of Political Science. Um, that's a degree that I enjoyed and passed well. Law, on the other hand, um, no one was happier to see me leave than the poor admin ladies in the TC Byrne uh, School of Law. I think my file had to be lifted with a um, forklift by the end of it. But anyway, matriculate, uh, graduate I did. And just as a quick note, I have to say, that the legal degree that I earned at the University of Queensland, which was a fine degree, um, particularly for those who truly accessed the, um, what everything the school had to offer, and even my political science degree, to this day still hold me in good stead. Even though I'm someone who stands before you as a prime example of what not to do with a law degree, um, even political science degree, the grounding I obtained at the University of Queensland um, is something for which I cannot give enough thanks. Um, and it's given me a rigour and a discipline and a font of knowledge that I apply in the most bizarre of places. Trust me. Um, so too the grounding I earned at the Courier Mail, a somewhat humble rag, as you all may know, um, something that it's not always easy to say that that's part of your um, part of your past, but to give the Korean mail its due, what I learned there, akin to an article of clerkship for a for a solicitor, um, I did for want of a better term a cadetship, and it didn't last very long, and it had me popping off to see Sally Ann Atkinson in the city hall running down to the Supreme Court, the District Court, Magistrates Court, doing a bit of this, doing a bit of that. The fundamentals of journalism, whilst they may be complicated in their practice, in essence are very fundamental principles. And they apply whether you're working on a City Council story here or whether you're out negotiating with Al-Qaeda in Iraq trying to fathom just what it is that they're trying to say and what it is they can actually do. So I will forever and a day be indebted to not only Brisbane, my hometown, I'm born and bred here, but also to the education that I obtained here. It's not one to be scoffed at. And I think that needs to be said. Anyway, now to the horror show. 
Um, very, very briefly. Um, humble journalist on the Courier Mail. I had my first taste of a foreign story in East Timor, actually, in late, late 1999. By then it was all over bar the shouting. Uh, the referendum had been held in Tefet. The Australian-led task force, led by General Cosgrove, had arrived. You know, the, 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 the real heat had gone out of the story. Um, but being a relatively newcomer to Rupert Murdoch's organisation back then, uh, I couldn't have expected to be first cab off the rank, and I was lucky to be the Christmas relief cab off the rank. I didn't care. I just wanted to go. Well, I've had typhoid. I've also had parasites that I don't think we need to discuss here. Some of which could only be diagnosed by Western tropical disease experts from out-of-date textbooks. Um, the point being this, more so than any ailment I've suffered in the field, and trust me, I've had a few, it was that first taste in Timor that was an elixir and, and an opiate or, a, or an addictive substance all at once. I had a small bite at an international story. And to be honest, not the world's biggest international story either. We cared about Timor here. The Portuguese cared. The Indonesians certainly cared. But really not many other people. It was a blip, a footnote in history. Nonetheless, that footnote gave me an insatiable desire to see more. I'd started as a local reporter. I'd had a few tastes of national stories here in Australia. When I got to have a nibble at a small international story and see the international press corps, people who I revered and feared and venerated, there was no looking back. Suffice to say, after six months in Timor, I came home to the, to the courier, to the then editor-in-chief, now maniacally running the Australian, Chris Mitchell, an old friend of mine. Um, and I said, mate, you know, I want to do more of this foreign stuff. And he goes, well, you know, we don't really have much room for it. He goes, I thought I might offer you the industrial round. <laughs> um, despite that, we remain good friends. I then went on to work for Time magazine here in Australia when it still had a South Pacific edition. I'm not sure if you're aware, but essentially Time magazine, there's at least five incarnations of Time magazine. Time domestic is the American time. That's the pace setter, the agenda setter. There's Time Asia, Time Europe. There was Time Latin America. Um, there was Time South Pacific. Small, humble office at Milsons Point overlooking Sydney Harbour, where five or six of us would gather to work for the editor there. Um, a man of incredible vision and inspiration, a Brit, but we won't hold that against him because he married well in Australia. He now runs the um, Weekend Australian magazine after the untimely death of the Time magazine uh, South Pacific edition. Even though it continued to make a profit when all, el when all others weren't, the profit just wasn't enough to save it. So I worked for what is now a defunct edition of Time magazine. However, I went to Pakistan uh, shortly after 9-11. I had the badger to be put on the roster. Um, in New York, I was from a far-flung colonial outpost. Sydney, South Pacific, they're lucky they knew the editor's name. They didn't know that any, the rest of us even worked for them. It was a great week if you managed to get a story in Time Asia. The one story I did get into Time Asia was about um, headhunting um, witch killers uh, in Papua New Guinea. So, you know, uh, with the rise of AIDS and the pandemic there, unfortunately, there's a rise in um, female homicides. You know, fit, healthy young man suddenly withers and dies for no apparent external reason. Must be a witch. And the witch killings went through the roof. The police believed in them too, so there's 
as far as I'm aware, there's been very few, if any, prosecutions. Um, the chap I met there who headed my story, I said, um, so-and-so has not killed a witch in five years. He's sitting there with three skulls. But he knows there's more out there. I didn't quite take comfort in that. Um, but that ran in Asia, and that represented the significance of the Australian edition. However, I badgered and badgered to be allowed to go in any relief stint, no matter first wave, second wave, third wave. I didn't care if I was carrying the water. I just wanted to go. It even got to a point where my then editor, now on the Weekend Australian, and the godfather to my son, um, realised that I was planning to take my holidays and just head to, Tajik to Tajikistan and push on in, was how fervent I'd become in covering that conflict. Luckily, a uh, vacancy opened on the first relief stint and I went into the Pakistani town of Quetta, which has a remarkable history. If none of you have, have considered it, please take a moment and do it's now the headquarters of the Taliban High Command, just in case you're wondering, um, in Pakistan, in clear view. But we'll come to that. Um, so I went into Quetta. My job was three-week relief stint for an eminent American coming out. I went into Kandahar just a day, day and a half after the fall of the Taliban and Mullah Omar had disappeared into the dust. Three weeks turned into 13 months. I had one trip home uh, in the middle of all of that. Um, it must have been about April because in March was a pivotal engagement, a battle. We all know about Tora Bora where Osama got away. The Americans were relying on Afghan militias and as I came to know Afghanistan over the years that I lived there, that's not something the Americans should be doing, relying on Afghan militias. Anyway, Osama got away. He paid more than the CIA. We then come, a month or so later, there's a holdout in mountain passes. We're talking 9,000, 10,000 feet. Uh, American helicopters aren't built to fly that high. Soviet helicopters fare a little bit better. Um, instead of using Afghans, the Americans decided to send in Australian SAS, um, to send in, obviously, Green Berets, Delta, to send in Rangers, to send in the 10th Mountain, elements of the 10th Mountain Division. It was a rather ugly affair, I'm afraid to say. If any of you can cast your mind back, it was called Operation Anaconda. It was fought in late March 2002. It was the first American boots on the ground engagement. Al Qaeda got away, as they always do. They were using old Soviet redoubt or redoubts and bunkers from the Soviet times, same goat tracks, same paths same smugglers as they were when they were fighting the Soviets on the CIA payroll. All that aside, I got to come home shortly after that, conceive my son, um, and return to Afghanistan. Three weeks turned into 13 months. Mostly my own fault, I have to admit. Um, each week, working for the New York headquarters, who didn't know me from Adam, um, I would just humbly besiege or, or to seek favour of my editor who I'd never met and barely knew his name and just say, look, if you're happy with this week's copy, I'm happy to stay another couple of days. And so it went on. 